All right, so the title of today's presentation is Aren't You Hot in Those Clothes? Because that's one of the most common things that as a reenactor you're asked, especially at a summer reenactment, aren't you hot? Yeah, just as hot as you are, <laughs> is the simple answer. Kind of like the questions, is that a real fire? Is that a real baby? Is that a real stew? Yeah. <laughs> so when you think about the first people, the, the Puritans, the, the colonists that come to Jamestown, the people come into Georgia and Louisiana, um, you know, where they're coming from, the Europe that they're coming from is a pretty temperate area. They're not used to the extremes in temperature. If you remember a couple summers ago, Europe was having that horrible heat wave. Most of the buildings over in Europe don't have air conditioning. So pe these people are coming from areas where they can wear wool almost all year long, you know, a lightweight wool even in the summertime, especially if you're in a mountainous area. So they're getting over here and, whoa, talk about some shock to your system, especially depending on where you, where you live. Um, you know, Massachusetts, okay, they, not, not so bad, but the winters are much colder than they're used to. You get down into Louisiana, New Orleans, Savannah, Charleston area, summers and Tidewater, Virginia, summers are not a whole lot of fun. So there had to be adaptations that were made. So what we'll do while John will let, keep letting John fool around with that, um, I'll just sort of run through the basic items of clothing. So we'll start with the men. So the men's first item of clothing is going to be his shirt. And of course, it's all going to depend on your station. It's all going to depend on what you're going to do that day. So if you're a field hand, your clothes are going to represent what you are doing. If you're a gentleman or a businessman or a craftsman, you know, if you're a master craftsman of some kind, your clothes are going to represent what you do. So this just is in generalities. So the first item that you'll have is a shirt. And this is the essential shirt. It's you thinking, whoa, that's long. Uh, now this fits my husband, but um, yes, it is long because underwear hasn't been invented yet. Okay, so this gets tucked around your derriere as you tuck it into your britches. So for men, the basic item of clothing is your shirt. Obviously, you're going to have long stockings on. They're going to be the next thing you put on. They are held up with garters, no elastic. The garters could be a, a buckle, a leather with a buckle. They could simply be a piece of uh, tape, uh, linen or wool tape that maybe your wife or your children wove for you or you purchase at the store. And then you'll have your breeches. And breeches in the 18th century... There's several different styles, but one of the things to know is how many buttons are on these darn things. So we've got two buttons here, if I can get them undone, and then you have the buttons here before you can uh, use the necessary. So there's a lot of buttons, and we'll talk about that a little bit further here later on. Then... Um, man's going to have what's called a waistcoat. We would sort of think of it as a vest that will go on over his shirt and his breeches. And depending if he's going to be around the house, he'll uh, have maybe just put that on. But if he's going to go out in public, he's going to have a jacket on that goes over. And there are different kinds of jackets, and I have some photos if we figure out how to do this. Um, that you can see different styles of things. So the jacket's going to go on next. He'll have a neckerchief or cravat around his neck. And if he's going out on the town, he'll have a hat. If it's wintertime in the house, he might have a hat he wears inside. My husband actually is recently on blood thinners, and now he's always freezing. So he's taken to wearing his 18th century hat inside <laughs> because I'm always hot. And he's always cold, so it's it's kind of a conundrum. For women, your basic undergarment, again, remember, no underwear yet. 
is going to be your shift. And it's just usually white linen, might have been wool flannel in the winter time. You know, you're going to dress according to, again, what you're going to do. So it goes on over that, you are going to tie on your pockets. 18th century pockets are a separate item of clothing. Lucy Lockett lost her pocket. Kitty Fisher found it. Not a penny was there in it, only ribbon round it. So the pockets go on next. And while pockets sometimes are very decorative, and often women would make pockets for one another and give them as gifts, there's a couple men in the audience, so excuse me, but ladies, we know we wear the fancy underwear mostly for ourselves, and we know we have it on, and that's just kind of what makes it fun. Same kind of thing. So you put that on. The next thing you're going to put on are your shoes and stockings because the next item of clothing is your stays. And once you have your stays on, you really can't bend over to put your shoes and stockings on. So you have to make sure you have them on ahead of time. And then your stays go on, on top of your shift. Now, where's the, there you are. <laughs> so they go on over your shift, like I have on the mannequin here, now over your shift, and they're laced, they're tight, but they're not squeeze you tight. They're not Scarlett O'Hara 17 inch waist. That's not what we're talking here. This is like a comfortable squeeze all day long. It's also, I tell the kids when we have the kids come and I'm talking about clothing with kids, you know the black belts that the guys at Home Depot wear? That's what this is. Because as an 18th century housewife, you're lifting cast iron, pet uh, kettles, you're, you're doing farm work. This is like one of those back braces. You'd be surprised how much better your back feels at the end of the day wearing one of these as opposed to not wearing one of these. Um, when I first started at Chad's Ford and made this, this is actually the first set I made, I'm still wearing them. Um, I was amazed after doing uh, hearth cooking demonstrations for school kids and stuff how less tired I was at the end of the day just by wearing a pair of stays. It made the biggest difference. There are also fashion issues to give you the correct form, which is sort of an ice cream, upside down ice cream cone kind of, you know, ice cream cone kind of shape, but it's not a squeeze you in. You know, like I said, it's not that 17 inch wide. Uh, I actually, if they're correctly made, they're very, very comfortable. Stays are not necessarily something you're going to make yourself. You're going to have a stay maker do them because the, the, at the time you could use, um, you could use wood as, as, a, as a reeds and stuff as, as the channel, you know, as boning, but most of the boning was baleen and it takes quite a bit of strength to separate the baleen and work with that. So that is something that a tailor does or a stay maker does. That's more of a, a specialized craft. As far as who's, yeah. So it goes, it goes just about here. And then it keeps you, Excuse me, gentlemen, lift it up. <laughs> it keeps you lifted up. It works just like your modern bra to, to, to uh, form you, let's put it that way. <laughs> Whoops, oh, my little trick didn't work there. But it's not bad, it's really not bad. So once you have that on, Typically, you're going to have several petticoats on. Uh, in the summertime, you'd compensate. In the wintertime, you'd compensate the other way. So maybe if it's summer, you'll wear very, very lightweight linen. Uh, maybe you only put one petticoat on. Maybe you put two on. Maybe you jack one up on the uh, outside of it. In the 18th century, the petticoats are set up so that there are slits on both sides so that you're able to get in to get to your pockets. So this is the pocket hole, if you will, for your, your uh, to get to your pockets. Um, 
when you tie these on uh, through experimental archaeology, uh, many reenactors have decided the way the best way to put these on is not to tie. If you ha have it as a drawstring, it's really too bulky at your waist. It's very uncomfortable. But if you put it on a waistband with the ties, and most of women's clothing is held up with pins and strings. And there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you take the back panel and you tie it around the front, and then you take the front panel and tie it around the back. It makes it much more stable. So depending on what you're going to do, it will depend on what you're going to wear up top, the top part of you. If you're going to be working around the house, working around the farm, you might wear something that's a garment that's very much, uh, you don't find it down south so much, you don't find it in New England as some, but not as much, and that's a, it's an item of clothing that's simply called a short gown, and it just goes around this way, and it pins together in the front. You'll then put an apron over, you'll tie your apron in the front, Again, it makes it much more stable. We know a lot of this. How do we know a lot of this? You know, we look at pictures. We look at uh, commentary. Uh, and if you look at a lot, there's pictures of the middling sort and the poorer sort. They're called Cries of London. Uh, most, some are colorized, some are just pencil sketches. And if you look at those closely, most of those working women have their aprons tied in the front. It also makes perfect sense if you're cooking you don't want danglies in the back when you turn around that could be in the fire. Which kind of brings up another subject. Lots of times you'll go to historic houses and they'll tell you the women died in the fire all the time. They burned up in the fire. Joan of Arc, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of the beauties of the clothing that they're wearing is if you are wearing wool, wool will self-extinguish itself. You can do burn tests, take a piece of wool, light, make sure it's 100% wool. If it's polyester, it's just gonna melt. That is very bad. <laughs> but if you have pure wool and you burn it, it will, it will, if you put a match to it, it'll burn itself out. Linen, especially if you're wearing uh, linen that you've processed and made yourself, it smokes and smolders and, and doesn't really go foof. And we have, lift off. <laughs> Yay! So, <laughs> good things come to those who wait. So, um, you know, were there accidents? Yes. Elizabeth Drinker, who ke keeps a diary in Philadelphia her entire life, the whole unabridged is volume after volume after volume, and she is not necessarily a hypochondriac, but if somebody's sick or if there's an accident, she really makes note of that. And there's only, mm, I had a friend who did a study, and I think she picked out like three times that she mentioned somebody being hurt from cooking in a fire in her whole life. So, you know, and you grew up doing it. So you, you were careful. You learned how to do it. You knew what to do, what not to do. But yes, aprons tied in the front are better because you don't want the danglies. <laughs> now, if you're going to be doing maybe just some modest uh, work around the house, let me take this one off here. Um, if you're going to be doing some modest work around the house, um, cooking, you could, use, you could put on a gown. And Southern and New England, most of the inventories um, have gowns in them. Whoa, try not to rip the cord out there. So you might put on a gown. It's a full length as opposed to the short gown. All right. And I have cooked in this. It works just fine. You learn to do it. It is fairly heavy. It is fairly heavy. It's a lot of fabric. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe you're, you, you know, you could use that. This one is modeled after one in the Chester County Historical Society. It's on, it's a, the one in the Historical Society is a block print. 
Uh, it's actually on the cover of the book called Fitting and Proper. I have a picture of it in here later. I'll point it out to you. But one of the interesting things to note was when I was trying to to reproduce it um, based on the drawings that Sharon Bernstein offered in her book and the pictures. And I'm looking at the pictures and I'm trying to put the pieces together and I'm like, God, why does there look like there's a seam there? There shouldn't be a seam there. And then it, you know, I'm not used to, it dawned on me, I could go in and look at this. <laughs> so I called Ellen Enslow and she very graciously got it out for me and looked at it and here, the actual original is patched in various places and the block print, and that's what I was seeing, where I was seeing a seam that shouldn't be. But as I have worn this, I noticed wear marks happening in the same places where the patches were on the original. So a little bit of experimental archeology span there. And the same thing with my favorite uh, piece of clothing here is my jacket, and I'm seeing the same wear patterns on that. So, you know, it just depends what you were doing, what your status, you know, if you're going to work, if you're a lady of the house and just sitting around, you'll be uh, working with that. And now that John has that going, let's see if we can make the magic happen. So we've kind of done, now let's see. Why do I need to point this to make it work, maybe? Or we just do it this way. Ah, okay, so we sort of got through the ladies. All right, so what did they have to say about the clothing that they wore? Here's a, a quote from a book by Linda Baumgarten, um, who sadly just passed away recently. She worked at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, Traveler in the early 1730s described the summer clothing of Virginians. In summertime, even the gentry go many in white holland linen, waistcoat and drawers, and a thin cap on their heads and thread stockings. The ladies straight laced in thin silk or linen. In winter, they dress mostly as in England and affect London dress and ways. So they were noting that it was And here's, this is a great one, again, from Linda's book. The clothing must be as thin and light as possible, for the heat is beyond your conception. This is Tidewater, Virginia, William & Mary College. It gets hot down there, if anybody's ever been down there in the middle of the summer. It is unbearable, and I can't imagine you know, just the adjustments that would have to be made where the thinnest stuffs that can be made without lining. Some people wear brown holland coats with lining, some crepe, and you must carry with you a stock of linen waistcoats made very large and loose that they mayn't stick into your hide. <laughs> I love that part. I love that part. And a Virginia woman related that uh, she did not get dressed immediately on a particularly sultry day. She remained upstairs in only her shift in petticoat till after, de after tea. As Sally Wister's uh, journal, she's a young girl. Uh, her family goes outside of Philadelphia, they live in Philadelphia, they go outside. And on a June day in her diary, she comments that she had to adjust her clothing because it was so hot. You just, like we do, you adjust, you adjust. So it all depends on the kind of weave. Your basic fabric choices, your basic plain weave, the over and under, I'm, I'm looking at the right generation here. You'd be surprised how many little kids don't know what I'm talking about when I say, did you ever make a pot holder? <laughs> We're really falling down with the younger kids. They need to make some pot holders for grandma. But it's a basic weave, that over and under, over and under weave. And it's fairly loose. It's not a real tight weave. And then the twill weave, that's, you, know, the, you get the diagonal uh, lines in it. That, as you can see, is a much tighter weave. And then the silk satin. Just to give you, it all depends on the patterns of the, the over and unders. So just some basic, no, you know, I had, a, I had a glossary of fabric. I guess I left it out in the car. But summer weight cloth, 
linens, you have your cambric, your holland, your lawn, your Osnaberg. Osnaberg's more very low class, enslaved people wearing Osnaberg. Um, it's, it's a very coarse linen. Uh, calico, of course, is your cotton. It comes from India originally. Dimity, muslin, nankeen. It, nankeen is a very, very soft cotton. It's, it's a yellowish cotton. Did you know cotton used to come in colors, not just white? Yeah, pink cotton, lavender cotton. I'd like to see that. But they bred it out so that it could be white and consistent and color, they could color it as they wanted. I want to go back to the pink and lavender cottons. And then you have your different ki kinds of silk. Of course, the common folks are going to be wearing linens, maybe some cottons. The higher class folks are going to wear some silk. And down in Virginia and New Orleans, the, the higher class folks are going to wear lightweight silk. But of course, a lot of that depends on where you live. Again, we sort of touched on this, you know, if you live in Charleston, if you live in Savannah, you know, you're going to adjust accordingly. You're going to wear what you can. You're going to probably go through several changes of clothes a day if you're uh, working really hard. Massachusetts, maybe not so much. Although the one year I took my kids to Plymouth and I thought it'll be cooler. We'll go up there, it'll be cooler. Yeah. I have, I have the picture of the two most dejected, hot little kids standing out of, up front of one of the Plymouth houses at Plymouth Plantation that you've ever seen. <laughs> it's like, if you come in the house, it's cooler. No, we don't want to. <laughs> okay. And again, like I said, it depends on what, you, uh, what you're doing for the day and your status. We kind of already talked about that. It also depends on what you can afford. Most of the clothing is being brought in. Today, it's kind of reversed. What's expensive is the, the fabric, and the, the labor is, is, or excuse me, the fabric is fairly inexpensive, and the labor costs us money. In the 18th century, it was the other way around. The fabric was more expensive, and then the labor was fairly cheap. One of the things to note in Chester County, the women, as far as clothing production, there was always a little bit of clothing production, but a lot of women in Chester County Okay, well, this is a Chester County crew, this farm area. So what did Chester County, what was Chester County's main, one of the main exports? Well, wheat, butter and cheese, dairy operations. This is dairy country. And so women soon determined that textile production is long and tedious they decided that their efforts were better spent making cheese and butter to sell and buying their fabric. It was just more economically feasible, feasible for them to do. Uh, there's a great book, uh, Loosening the Bonds by Joan Jensen, I believe. It talks about Chester County area and this, this very thing is something if you're interested, I would totally encourage you. I'm pretty sure Chester County Library has a copy of it. So it just depends what you can afford, because it's all being imported. So how do we know? How do we know what they're wearing? Advertisements. Here's an advertisement from Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, between Front and Second Streets. And he's got uh, yard wide and uh, yard 3 8 cotton and linen checks and stripes and stripes hollands and silk damasks. He's got checked linen and printed lawn, handkerchiefs, Barcelona handkerchiefs, cravats, silk cottons. He's got it all. You can go and get it from him. He'd be happy to sell you the cloth. Some of it you might make yourself. Some you might take to the, the mantua maker, which is a seamstress in the 18th century, or you might take to the tailor. Your small clothes, your shifts, your shirts, things like that, you're going to probably make those at home. And then we have runaway ads. So if you were an indentured servant and you decided, mm, I've had enough of this guy, or he thinks I still owe him two years and I think I'm done, 
and I take off. Maybe and I'm an apprentice and I decide this isn't for me and I take off. So they would advertise for you. And they would put advertisements in the Pennsylvania Gazette and other magazines and they would list, if you took stuff with you, they would list out what it is. This particular gentleman who ran away uh, took with him a coat, uh, a jacket, and velvet breeches, one checked and several white linen shirts, a pair of stockings. He took a new beaver hat. That wasn't cheap. And silver shoe buckles. Whoever takes up said servant and brings him home and secures him so as his master may have him again shall receive the reward. So let me see if I can get this. I can get this guy to work. Maybe not. I don't know where to push, where to point it, where this is working. Um, here's another one. This one is my favorite one of all that I've ever found. Mary Richards takes off. She's absconded from his bed and board. That's his wife. <laughs> Without any just cause. Hmm. <laughs> and took with her a great number of clothes. Among them were a new black caster hat with a yellow band two calico short gowns, one of which is very dark purple, three long gowns, one of which is pompadour ground cotton, nearly new, and one a light ground flowers made with long sleeves, a pair of black velvet shoes, two pair of silver sleeve buttons, one pair marked MR. This is the part I love. Any person who shall give information where the said Mary Richards has absconded to so that I may get her or her clothes shall receive the reward. I get the feeling he really wants the clothes, not her. This just, this, this is my favorite one because it really look, reads like he doesn't really care if she comes back, but he wants those clothes back because they're expensive. This, this, like I said, this would just, this would just hits my funny boom. Then we have wills. Women are leaving their clothes to relatives to their servants so we can look at these and see what they've got you know this uh, lady is from Lancaster County she's got a calico wrapper a cambric apron she's got a black Barcelona's handkerchief a petticoat and a cloak and then to her sister she's leaving and uh, her niece she's leaving her other gowns Elizabeth Chads at Chads Ford leaves her nieces most of her clothes so we can see from the clothing, uh, the wills. And then in addition to the wills, there are the estate inventories. This is an estate inventory of a woman who um, was a widow. So we have an estate inventory for her alone. If your husband died, they would do an estate inventory and it would include all your stuff too. You didn't own your stuff, he did. Elizabeth Barnes, uh, the Barnes Britton house down on Route 1, part one of the Chadsford properties. When William Barnes dies, he owes everybody and his brother money, and, and she is actually loaned money to buy some of her items back from the, the they call it a vendue at that time, it's a state auction, but she's actually loaned money to buy back her spinning wheel and some of her clothes and other things. So keep that in mind. But. You know, this, this woman has, a, has quite a bit of, of, of clothing here. Uh, she's got a black quilted petticoat, and a pair of stays, two pairs of shoes, uh, shifts, gowns, different kinds of gowns. A bed gown is similar to the uh, short gown. It's just a little bit longer. Pounds, shillings, pence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This one? It's pr it's, so that's when the will was proved. So they probably got the clothes before then. It, um, it just means that it was, the whole estate was probably settled in 1805 as opposed to 1801. There may have been arguments over if she had, I don't know, from, I don't remember from this if she had property and there was arguments about it. There could have been 
something like that going on. But the, the girls probably got their clothing. Um, here's another inventory, uh, a man's inventory. This one's got 24 shifts. I think he's got a lot of women in the family. He's got 10 short gowns, so I think there's a lot of, lot of women in his family. But again, that's my point. You don't own it, your dad does. The other way is artwork. You look at the, the modern art, or not modern, but artwork of the period. This is a, a German artist, and he did a, a painting of his family, so you get a little bit of idea of, of, of that. Um, there's a, a lot of artwork about uh, people doing everyday things. We have the turkey plucker over here. She, she's wearing what, uh, a bed gown, and so is the uh, attentive nurse. You see how it's a little bit longer and their aprons over top. And you notice how their, their petticoats are not touching the floor. You know, you're working. You've got to be able to move around. It's not sweeping the floor. Even when, if you're wearing a ball gown, it's not floor length because you need to move your feet around. So uh, it's not something, when I was making clothing, I would always have people put on their petticoats and try to walk up and down stairs without lifting their petticoats up. And then I knew it was the right length. Chocolate pot girl, and my favorite, the girl pouring chocolate. She's a screensaver at home. <laughs> and then, not to be outdone, the men have theirs. Uh, Cadwalder there, he's a little more of a, a, a businessman type, and he's not got quite as fancy of a waistcoat as... Uh, Thomas over Theodore Atkinson over here on the other side. These Copley paintings. And again, two of the little girls. And these are the cries of London that I was telling you about. Uh, some have been colorized, but they focus on what, you know, what the everyday guy was wearing. And these are just wonderful uh, ways to get a, a glimpse into you know, what the everyday, and again, you see their petticoats there, they're working women, they're not dragging the ground. There's a huge, huge, especially in London, there's a huge market for used clothes, so there's, there's, there's uh, you know, if you can't make it, you can't buy the fabric and make it yourself, maybe you can buy used clothes. So while they struggled to deal with the heat, it was beyond your conception, and like I said, so the next time you meet a reenactor, yeah, we're hot, just like you are. We just have a few more layers on. I do want to mention, um, before I uh, wind up here for questions, so what about kids? So in the 18th century, an infant in the beginning is going to be swaddled, especially early on, so that baby's going to be wrapped from head to toe like a little mummy. It sounds cruel, it sounds heartless, but actually, it also keeps them very safe because I can give that bundle of that mummified child who can't move, can't roll over, can't do anything to another child to hold on to, and they're not going to squirm out of their arms. I can lay him on a table, and he's going to be there when I come back. Um, kind of the downside is the recommended was that you change them once a day, and we've all been there, and we know that that's not going to work very well. But... Be that as it may, once the baby got a little bit bigger, they are all, boy or girl, going to be put into gowns. All right? So they are going to wear a little shift like this, and they're going to have a gown over top. And this is a bigger one. This is my niece's from long ago. She's now this tall. but um, <laughs> So it's just a gown, has leading strings in the back. And these are very helpful. When you get little kids get out of control, you can <laughs> yank them back from the fire. Well, my son and my niece used to have a good time playing with these, with uh, giddy up reins kind of a thing. <laughs> he'd, he'd drive her as the horse around. But um, the other thing about this with boys and girls is, you know, so they're still in nappies, especially when they start. 
and especially with boys. You saw how many buttons are on those breeches? Yeah, boys don't get breeches till they can work the buttons. And so boys are breached, put into breeches at about four or five, depending on when they, because mom's not gonna make more work for herself. This is easy, yank up the gown, change the nappies, send them to the outhouse, they can pull it up themselves. They don't have to worry about getting all those buttons undone in time. So both boys and girls are gonna wear this. Young girls are gonna start wearing stays. Probably a friend of mine used to, when I was asking about my daughter when I was doing reenacting and she was coming, I said, so when does she, you know, when do I have her in stays? And she says, when she starts to cast a shadow. Okay, <laughs> I guess that's now. <laughs> but sometimes young boys were put in stays as well because 18th century posture was a lot different than our posture. We don't sit up near as straight as, as we should have. Their posture was shoulders down and back. And through uh, some experimental archeology span on my own, I um, belonged to Birmingham Friends Meeting. And when I was at Chad's Ford and Brandywine, if I had an event, I might go to meeting in my clothes and then go to, down to work. And I found I was a whole lot more comfortable with my stays and all this on on those straight benches than I am in modern clothes. And I realized it's because I'm forced to sit up with my shoulder blades back because the clothing is actually, especially a man's jacket is tighter across the back. It's built very narrow across the back to keep your shoulders back. And so I learned that in modern clothes, if I sat on those nice straight benches and sort of lifted my shoulder blades up and wrapped them around the back of the bench, I could sit there for a real long time without a, a whole lot of problem. So when next time you think of those straight benches, how in the world did they sit there? That's because they had the right kind of clothes on to do it. This particular shift is a copy of one that is in the collection of Landis Valley Museum uh, that I made. I bought this little form at a uh, conference uh, oof. Five years ago, maybe nobody wanted. It was in their it was in their silent auction. Nobody wanted it. I'm like, well, I'll figure out something to do for it. Sixty bucks, sure. Um, so the little shift, the stays here. These are a reproduction of a pair that are in the Colonial Williamsburg uh, collection. I took a class down at Williamsburg from one of the uh, uh, a business down there, Burnley and Trowbridge, and they run classes using uh, the different. Uh, staff from Williamsburg helps them out and uh, does that. So they are precious. <laughs> but I can't imagine wrapping a little kid in that. Uh, so any questions? So, and that's one of the reasons for all the layers. So, if, when you're wearing the shift, that's absorbing most of the sweat and the body odors. So the shift is easy to wash. You're not gonna wash the stuff that's the outer, that's one of the reasons you wear an apron is because you keep trying to keep everything clean. Apron, the shift is easy to wash. The other stuff, laundry is a big deal <laughs> because the weather has to be right, um, you got to do it mostly outside, you know, put things out on the bushes to dry and things like that. So major laundry isn't done. Depends on how many changes of clothes you have, but it's, most stuff is sponged off, especially the wool and the silk. It's sort of sponged off and, and you know, made it as clean as you can. I love to go to the fabric store and tell the people, oh, yeah, I'm buying this wool, I'm going to go home and wash it and they freak out. You can wash wool. It's not the water, it's not necessarily the hot water, it's the agitation that shrinks. You're felting it when you agitate it. So you can wash wool, you just have to do it the right way. But I love going to, I love playing with the people at the fabric store. I'm evil that way. Any, any other questions? 
if if you are a higher class and you have a maid, yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. You and you and you and your girls are going to do it, and that you know we have big families anyway, so everybody gets involved, and probably some of the boys would help with you know because you got to go get the water. It's the same way with taking baths. You don't have a bath very often because it's a big process. You got to get the water. You got to heat it up. You got to you know have the bath, change the water, whatever, and and then you got to get rid of the water. Um, did they wash off? Yeah, you know, you, a pitcher of water and a basin of water and you wash off in the morning or at night. Yeah, you washed up. Elizabeth Drinker in Philadelphia, one part of her diary says that, um, talks about her neighbor gets a shower. And I sort of envision it as being one of those like camp showers, you know, you put up in a tree and you pull the thing. And so he invites her to try it. And she didn't like it. She says it's the first time her body's ever been wet all over at the same time, and she didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. <laughs> something, so, something so simple we do every day. Yes? Oh, yeah. So if you're working in the kitchen garden, you're, you're going to wear your lightest, you know, if it's a hot day, you're going to wear your lightest clothing. You probably are just going to have one petticoat on. You may strip down to it's just your stays and your, your petticoat. You may not wear a gown. You might still have a kerchief on because that will protect your neck from the sun. Um, you might even dip that kerchief in some water and then wrap it around your neck. And you're going to have a hat on. You're going to wear a straw hat. You're going to have... And men, same thing. They would strip down to just the breeches and a shirt, probably. But that would be considered undressed. So if somebody came by, you'd quick excuse yourself to go get dressed. <laughs> so towards the end of the 18th century, drawers are invented for men. But think about all the layers that a woman has on. It's a lot, not to get too indelicate, it's a lot easier if you don't. <laughs> because everything's tied around your waist, so it's, it's almost easier if you don't. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. My friend made them for me. Like I said, that was very traditional that women wouldn't make each other fancy pockets, and my friend um, made them for me years ago. So they're special. And they're, I can get more in them than I can in these pockets. Mm-hmm. You know, I can get two big water bottles in either side, and you never know I'm carrying them. <laughs> Yeah, but you would, you know, a housewife would keep her keys. Um, spice chests would also often, tea would often be locked up, so you'd have household keys that you'd have on, on the keychain there or on, on a key. Uh, you might have uh, some sewing implements, uh, a chatelaine kind of thing. You might keep that in the pocket. You might wear it. So you could put, a, a, I have a little notebook in mine and a little pencil that I keep in there so that I can always take a note if I need to. Um, if I'm cooking, I have my, I have my recipes are in a little book, and I keep that in my pocket. Yeah, there's pockets built into the um, breeches as part of ooh, all the fly fronts here. So there's a pocket here that goes into the front. And then... I don't know if I put one in this or not. There's sometimes a watch pocket on the inside for a watch. But yeah, so the men have built-in pockets. OK, anybody else? Well, you're welcome to come up and take a look at things. Um, thank you all for coming today.